1988 and 1989 weren't bad, but they also didn't end up in championships. Mm -hmm. What was the mood like in Welcome? At that um, the 80, the year Rusty won it, it's kind of a two-sided story there. Um, we broke a cam at Charlotte, and Rusty won by 12 points that year. And when, when they, we got that car back to the shop and they took the motor out, the cam had broke clean. You could have fixed it easy. And, you know, back then you did, you couldn't change motors, but you did anything in the world to make laps. And so we kind of told ourselves after that that if, it, if we ever broke a cam again, we were going to fix it. And that's how we ended up at Dover that year early on in the race. Uh, broke a cam and we went behind the wall and pulled the motor out and changed the camshaft and went back out and it finally blew up. But um, that year we lost by 12 points, so you can blame it on any situation, but it, we, we kind of hooked it on the losing that motor at Charlotte. But the, the other year was the year of the Hoosier tires. And because of Dale's loyalty and Richard's loyalty, there was races where nobody was on them but us and Dave Marcus. And um, at that was that the same year Bobby got hurt too? Yeah. yeah. And that that took the wind out of his sails. It really did. And, out of uh, Dale's? Out of Dale's sails. Did it really? Uh, absolutely, yes. Okay. And, um, you know, he went up there to see him a time or two and, you know, Bobby being in that situation. And, you know, they, were, they weren't they were tremendously close like him and Neil were, but they were close. And, um, you know, the, 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 you can't say there's excuses for because everybody we were racing against has an excuse why they didn't do any better. Yeah. But that, that year with the Hoosier tires um, – there was races we didn't have a chance. I mean, there's people passing us. I didn't even know um, who it was that was passing us. You know, they just had on Hoosier tires. I'm going to tell you a story about that that I don't know if you've ever heard before. Um, there were some races where we ran Hoosier tires. Some races we'd have both. Um, you'd have 20 sets of tires, and you ran whatever was best. Well, we get – we were – I don't remember what race it was, but we had got some tires – from I want to say it was Lake Speed, but it was one of the Hoosier cars. Well, Chocolate at the time uh, was dismounting all the all the tires, and uh, I don't. I hope I don't get myself in trouble telling this story, but this is a fact. And so Chocolate's out there dismounting those tires, and he comes in there and gets me. He says, "Come out here and look at this." And I don't know if, how many people watch the tire be dismounted before. You know, you break it down, and then the step on the button, and it goes around and knocks the bead off and he'd go this is one of our tires and he'd put the thing on there and put the button and it'd go and knock the bead off the rim he said this is one of the tires off a lake speeds car so he'd put it on there and push the button and it'd go and just the tire was just a totally different tire with the same number on it and uh so we called goodyear i'm sure richard called goodyear and told him and I want to say Daytona in July was the next race. And we took that the tire down there and uh, snuck it in the back. I don't know if you remember the Goodyear building, yeah. but snuck it in the back of the Goodyear building. Uh, back the there Hoosier where, Tire. The Hoosier Tire, okay. where um, Homer's office was back in that area. And, and Rick Campbell and those guys were in there. And they cut that tire apart, and it was totally different sidewall. And... Um, that was pretty much the end of the Hoosier deal. It was it was not long after that that uh, NASCAR made a rule that you had to have a concrete building at every racetrack. But the, um, there again, yeah. I said, I yeah. don't know if, I, uh, if if they don't want to hear that story, they don't want to hear the truth because that's what happened. Chocolate was the one that uh, if no, we hadn't bar if we uh, that car had dropped out of the race, so we got tires off of one of the cars. It was a a weekly Hoosier car that only ran Hoosiers. And, um, you know, there were several of, several of them that only ran the Hoosiers. And our Hoosiers and their Hoosiers were not even not even the same thing with the same number on it. So different teams were getting different. Yes. And so yeah. um, NASCAR got involved, and it was, there was no denying it. You know, they, yeah. had, the, they had the tire there, and, and when, you, when you sliced them in half, you could see that the, the sidewall was night and day different. On, wow. on some of the 
the cars that weren't going to win versus some of the cars that were going to win. And uh, that was that was pretty much the end of the Hoosier deal. Man, I hate to even ask the question, but 1990 Daytona 500. Mm-hmm. Tell me about it. Which which one was that? <laughs> I'm not, I, honestly, uh, they run together so bad. Okay, 1990 Daytona 500. Is that the Cope the Cope win? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, same deal. Um, you're sitting there, and they they come by, and and you're like, been here before, you know. We got this thing, and and uh, you know everybody didn't have a monitor on their pit box at the time, no big screens to watch, and uh, they're going down the back straightaway, and the crowd all jumps up, thought they wrecked or something, you know, and we're all got our neck stretched out, looking toward turn four, waiting to see our car come by, and it never came by, or it came by after everybody passed him with a flat tire. That was a tough one, yeah. That was. Uh, um, you know, he went straight to the garage and went down there to meet him. You can see the video, man. The look on his face was a, a total disbelief. Now, weren't you the first person to the car? Well, I, was, I was one of them. I've seen yeah. the video several times, and you know, there's press was all over him, and it was about as big. There was probably about as many people waiting to talk to him as there were. And the, the funny thing is, nothing against Derek because there was a lot of good, a lot of good friends on that on that team at the time. And um, Buddy Parrott and a bunch of those guys on, they were pitted right next to us. And so, you know, we're sitting there like, what the hell just happened? And they're all jumping up and down. And and you're pitted right next to each we're other. We're pitted right next to each other. Yeah, I remember that very clearly because, you know, I'm sitting there, you just didn't, you didn't even know what happened because he didn't say anything at first. And, and um, it was just on to the next one. You told me a story about leaving the racetrack and flying over the track mm-hmm. that day. What do you remember about that? Man, it just, it was just a yearly thing. You know, you flew in down there going, damn, we're, we're going to get you this time. And we flew out of there going, and it happened again. You know, the same, the, the year that, that Daryl won it, um, you know, we ran out of gas and, you know, just, all, it, it was just like, how many ways can we lose this damn race? <laughs> So 1990, you're back in the championship hunt. You and Mark Martin are like at it tooth and nail. There's not a lot of points between you. Uh, fall race at Charlotte, you come in for a stop, and he leaves pit road, and the tires fall off. What what happened? It, it's, this is very funny. I um, the I went to the auto fair. Today's Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. Went to the auto fair Saturday or Sunday last weekend. Yeah. And I'm restoring a, a Model T, and some guys I know that have helped me with it were coming up to pick up some parts, and they, they said, you want to go out front and, and look at uh, some of the Model Ts that are out in, in front of the racetrack. I'm like, sure. So we would go down pit road and actually went across the opening Um by the condos, and, you know, I see the grassy spot down there where we ran out there and changed <laughs> the those <knob>. tires. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I, I get so many pictures now that I've never seen before. A lot of them from Chris Hussey. Yeah, yeah. And you know, back then when Chobat and those guys would bring you the every picture that they took, yeah. so you could buy pictures. And I see so much stuff now that people send to me that I've never even seen before. And there's multiple pictures of the of us changing tires. Uh, down there in the grass on the with the cars going by, and NASCAR was not happy about that at all. But it was they you were using three guns at the time. And that's also the race. Two, it's a two part story. Um, two cars got together and hit the right side of our car on a pit stop, and uh, we were already around on the left hand side, or it would have really no telling what would have happened. Because you can look in those pictures of that of us down there changing the tires, and you can see all the right side damage. I can't remember who it was. Somebody, I want to say it was Ernie and somebody. I think Kowicki. Co- yeah. yeah, Ernie yeah. and Kowicki. Yeah. yeah, and they they spin they spin and and hit the right side of our car flat. It would have been really bad. And Richard actually went to him after that race and said, you know, there's no pit road speed, and you know. Could have lost all my guys right then, and 
it was that was October race, I guess, and then we went to Atlanta. Yeah. And that deal happened to the nine car. But anyway, so I go to that car show and we're walking out and I'm like, man, look, we ran down during the damn race using three guns. Back to that story. Sorry for skipping around on you. And the left side lug nuts were loose, and he thought it was a two-tire stop. And so he just leaves with no lug nuts on the left side. And you can remember the old Charlotte. As you left pit road, there was a kind of a hump where it went down back toward the racetrack. And when it went over that hump, both left side tires shot off. And, you know, Kirk, being Kirk, was like, what would you leave for, you know? It was yeah. Just yeah. miscommunications. And so – Without thinking, we just grabbed two tires and some sockets and ran down there and a jack. It was a uh, chocolate and Danny, Bobby Moody, uh, John Malloy, and uh, there was like five of us just ran down there and did it. And, and, the and you were one of them. Correct? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And ran down there and, and uh, picked the car up and put the jack underneath because it had no tires on it. And all we could do to get the tires underneath it. And People were throwing stuff at us and, you know, <laughs> booing and that, looking up at that condo, it looked like the yeah. Empire State Building. It, you yeah. Know. All right. So I have always been of the opinion that that won the championship that year. It, it probably didn't hurt. <laughs> but that was, that, and, was the, that was a definition of how, of how we approached it. And, and there was a race before that. You'll probably remember more than me. At – um, Bristol asphalt track when everybody would, would uh, blister tires and we popped a, a rear tire off a four and it spun and the car was sat down on the ground and it wouldn't, could, wouldn't go and he, he comes on the radio he's sitting there he won't, the car won't crank that's what it was uh, he hit, kept hitting the starter it wouldn't go and he, and, uh, he said come push it and we're like Come push it. You know, the caution's out at Bristol. Yeah. And he said, you're going to win this championship. Come push this damn car. So we ran out on the track and pushed him off. Wow. So that's twice we ran on the racetrack during the race. That I don't know that anybody else was stupid enough to do that. But that pretty much defined that group of guys was there was really nothing we weren't going to do. So we just talked about this a couple of weeks ago on the show, two or three weeks ago on the show. We just happened to talk about that issue, the Charlotte issue. And you guys, each of you that went out, were fined a hundred bucks. I, I couldn't even have told you that. I didn't remember and, that. And there were there were five guys who who got hit with a hundred dollar fine. And now you would have been kicked out permanently, probably. And and to 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 exchange. A championship for five hundred bucks. Yeah. I, I know we didn't pay it. Oh, Richard, <laughs> Richard must have paid it because we didn't pay it. Hundred dollars would have had a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. So yeah, you you do wind up winning the championship in ninety, but you alluded to it just a second ago. Uh, the nineteen ninety season finale at Atlanta. You are a rear tire changer. Mm -hmm. You'd had that deal happen at Charlotte where you'd escaped and Mike Rich was a rear tire changer. Mm -hmm. How much of an impact did his accident have on you personally? Man, it, there's actually a picture somebody sent me. Um, and you can see us standing on pit road. It's taken from the end of pit road looking back toward, and you can see Bill and them are starting to turn off. And it just, I can see that way clear. And I can see some of those Daytona 500s, but you see Rudd's car go around about in, in your peripheral you see it as Dale's pulling in the thing and you just run around there going that that couldn't have been good and then you know back then you didn't you just didn't know what you know everything that's happening now because of the monitors in the pits and yeah. all the all the social media and everything else I mean so you so you weren't necessarily aware oh, of, you, of the severity oh at yeah the time. yeah absolutely okay. right. absolutely we were yeah because there was just no way it couldn't have been okay all right. it was like i said it was very similar to what happened to us in october at charlotte that you know that we're on the on the left side and the impact just about knocked us all down and you know there's just you have no chance of surviving something like that if it's a direct hit but you know i went on and did it for several more years but 
It's, it's something that you knew you knew it was dangerous before that happened. Yeah, I'm surprised it hadn't happened more. To be honest yeah. with you. 1991 Daytona 500. I just want to hear your story about Kirk Shelmerdine trying to get the get the seagull out of the nose of the car. You said he was kind of squeamish. Yeah, <laughs> it was uh, same deal. He comes on the radio. He said, "I just hit a, a damn seagull or something." And we're like, "What?" And so the um, they zoomed in on it where you could see the damage. He still led the race for quite a while, but the, when the caution came out, that seagull had gone right in the oil cooler. Yeah, you know, seagulls are big ass birds. I didn't realize yeah, how yeah, big it yeah. was. And uh, so uh, there's a good picture of, of Kirk and I out there trying to get that bird out of the. <laughs> and then then you couldn't get to uh, to tape the hole up. You had to wipe all the bird off the <laughs> headlight door to get the tape to stick. So another one that I would have never believed happened. Over time, Dale got more and more involved in business stuff and doing whatever he was doing. Was there a specific moment when you felt the dynamics on the team shifting and and maybe losing at least a little bit of contact with Dale? Um, or did no. you ever sense that? Uh, yeah, a little, uh, very little. I mean, okay. it was. I, I've told people before that something as simple as when we would go to Richmond, he would come, you know, because it was basically on the way, or Martinsville. He, him, and Teresa would stop in his van, and and some of us might ride with him, and and he flew with us every week. And I don't, I don't even think we owned a plane at the time. He didn't. And we were leasing a plane through the Piedmont deal that we had continued on with. But just that hour and a half, two hours plane ride or car ride made a difference. You know, as time went on, he got a plane, we got a plane. And, you know, it, he, he, ne he, he didn't come to the shop every day or, you know, and he wasn't in Zoom calls or didn't call in. We didn't even have a team meeting, basically. You know, we knew what to do, and um, I think I think there was a little separation at that point, but I don't know that it hurt our performance because we went on to have several good years after that. But then, um, you know, we got behind the same old deal, man. We one of the biggest things I'm proudest about is the fact that we won back to back three times. Yeah, and between '88 and '89, I guess were the years. It was like 240 points. We kept from, kept us from winning six in a row, two, four, yeah, yeah, six straight. But anyway, it just um, we struggled that year. And when you're ahead, man, that's what the accomplishment of winning it back to back was so big because you you whatever you did last year wasn't good enough. So we knew every year we had to step it up and. And, uh, you know, it just comes to a point where that's n not achievable. I don't care what team it is. You look back in history and, and there comes to that point. And we, we were, we struggled. You're you talking know, about 92 when you, when yeah. that, that really down year. Yeah. And, um, you know, also at the same time, I don't think there's enough credit given to some of the teams that came into the sport at the time. You know, because even with all our success, we weren't, we weren't um, we weren't some kind of mega money pit. Uh, you know, we were racing against teams that had more money than we did. They didn't have Dale Earnhardt, but they <laughs> they had more people, and and uh, there was teams that that we beat in the championship that that had better stuff than we did, and uh, he was the difference maker for sure. But I think in time, you know, Roush kept getting bigger. Hendricks came on came online. You can look; there's pretty much a timeline right there of of how we tapered, and um, we were able to come back in '93 and '94. And um, but I, I don't know. Then I you know I went truck racing at halfway through '94. So had Kirk said anything about stepping down as crew chief? Or no. Had that? No. Did that come as a surprise? Total surprise. Did it really? Yeah, I mean, it, you could, looking back on it, after it happened, um, he always used to say, because, you know, he dabbled in racing a little bit, and he always used to say, how can the 
how can the the last place driver make more make the kind of money he makes? Yeah. You know, and and Kirk wasn't making any money. Hardly any crew chiefs were at the time compared to today. Good God, if if Kirk would have won four championships in six years today, he'd have been a multimillionaire in today's world. But it, sport wasn't there. And um, but I, looking back on it after the fact. Uh, the day he told us he was leaving was really the first time we'd ever heard that he was leaving. You know, and we were together every day. But um, did you try to talk him out of it? No, not really. I mean, he's he's set in his ways and still is today. I mean, and and he I'm sure he doesn't regret it. He did what he wanted to do. He wanted to go try and drive more. And <clears throat> but um, no, it had had no idea. But he was, he was really disgruntled to the fact that the driving side of it, that was when the salaries were starting to take off and the purse was getting bigger. And, and um, you know, the crew guys weren't making money. I, uh, some of the people that I had to hire in the Xfinity Series, I'd look at what they were ma- trying to want to make, and I'd say, I'd say, hell, I wasn't making that much winning the championship in <laughs> 10 or 11 races. Andy Petrie came on board <clears throat> as crew chief in 1993 and mm-hmm. talked to him, and he said that he faced quite a bit of pushback from the crew early on. What was the crew's reaction to him at first? Um, I don't know if it was. Was he an outsider? Of course. You know, no matter yeah. – he was just – what he faced was just – he was the uh, – he just happened to be the guy in that position. Anybody would have faced yeah. it. Yeah. You know, to, to come into a situation that had basically zero turnover in all those years, and um, for a basically a ten-year period of zero turnover, and you know, it was a pretty tight group. So I mean, yeah, it was. Uh, I'm sure it was hard on him, but uh, he brought some of it on himself at the same time. You know, he was <laughs> he. Uh, he was pretty set in his ways, and there was there was there was also times when we were trying to help him. You know, I'm sure you've heard the story about the going to the test, and Andy had a, a whole legal page of what he was going to do that day. Earnhardt takes it like he takes everything, snatch, he takes his pencil and goes <laughs> goes down through the whole list and scratches off some of the stuff he don't want to do. He says, "That's what I'm going to do," and that's how he was. And we were trying to. You know, also trying to save Andy from himself because Dale wasn't going to change that much. And <laughs> there was a that time, and then there was another time early in 93 when we were somewhere testing. It was getting late in the day, and he'd already said he was going hunting, going fishing, whatever he was going to do. Dale said this. Yeah. Okay. And we're making a change to the car, and I'm like, going, I had already seen him go in the truck. So we're kind of dragging our feet. And Andy's like, come on, guys, we got to go. We got to get this. We got to go to this next thing. And, you going to drive it? <laughs> and about that time, he comes out with his street clothes on. And he says, we're not done. He says, I'm done. And, you know, it was, <coughs> excuse me. There, you know, it was, we knew how Dale was. I'm not saying that we didn't need to try to get better because he, he brought things that did make us better for sure. A different way of thinking. And, um, but there was also ways about, trying to help him with Dale about what he was like, you know, to, to get to know the, the best, the things that were going to help him. You know, he might have got offended by that, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, we weren't going to do anything to hurt ourselves. We wanted to win races as bad as he did, and we, we, we went on and did it. Do you remember a specific turning point at, at which, okay, maybe we're on to something here after all? Because you did win two championships. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it was he's he's got a great personality, and you know he he fit in after a while. I think it was like anything else. We bent a little bit, so did he. You know, he uh, chocolate's pretty hard headed too, and you know it was really oh yeah. <laughs> you know, Andy Andy was one of those guys that like he's a, he sits in the right front seat, and and he listened to this radio station, and chocolate was like no. Oh, wow. We're going to listen to what we all want to listen to or, or where yeah, we're going to eat. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That it's, that it's, might not be a good example, but we bent some for sure because it was successful, and but so did he. And we were – there was things that, 
that we knew weren't going to work, and we were trying to we were trying to help his learning curve on a lot of it. Ninety four Daytona, uh, we lost Neil. Mm-hmm. How big an impact did that have on Dale and RC? Um, I, I know it was it was big on both of them, but it was obviously bigger on Dale. Obviously, at the time, it was man, it was tough, you know, because it went through the garage at what had happened, and and uh, you know, we still had to go through the rest of the week. But as far as I'm sure, it I'm sure it lingered on him more than he showed. At what point did you start thinking about cutting back on your travel schedule? Oh, probably just in '93. Um, cause I, Atlanta was my last race over the wall in, the, um, last race there in 93. Okay. And, uh, but just my kids were 13 and eight, something like that. And they'd pretty much, you know, like everything, like everything else, you turn around one day and they're like grown up and you're like, when did that happen? Yeah. And, um, you know, in our sport at the time, you know, there wasn't holidays and, uh, uh, with all the testing we were doing and stuff like that, it's it's funny um, how the sport has changed. Um, we, we were sitting around the shop one day when Clint, I want to say it was Clint and Harvick, but it was definitely Clint. And they were saying, oh, you guys had it easy. There was only 28 races uh, that, that particular year or whatever year it was, 28 to 30. And I'm like, yeah, and Martinsville opened on Thursday. All of them opened Thursday, Friday. Charlotte was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Talladega was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Daytona was a week and a half. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, really? I went, oh, yeah. And we tested 20-something times every year. But it was the same for everybody back then. But so anyway, that, that, that just tired of being gone. You know, we had accomplished so much. You know, I had offers to do different things. And financially, it would have been way better for me and might have been better for my future. But it was like, man, I am just tired of being gone. Yeah. And when you... If you're goal oriented, and we all are, you know, man, we there was nothing, nothing else left out there. You know, we had won so many damn races in that period of time, and um, it was just it was time for a change. You held different management roles at RCR after that. You eventually had an office. Um, how big of an adjustment was it for you to be behind a desk at least part of the time? As opposed to actually turning wrenches out in the shop. Well, there was there was a big span between that, you know, because halfway through the '94 deal, uh, still working in the shop, and uh, still went to a couple races early on in the year, just for the, as they went through the transition of somebody else changing tires, and and doing tires, you know, because I did tires and changed tires. So went to a few races early on, and then was just kind of settling into working in the shop when the truck series started and richard was like you want to this got this thing coming along you want a shot at managing it and i'm like yeah you know it's limited schedule places i haven't been and and so it was it was cool to uh, start from scratch with a team and but we were very fortunate to get a bunch of really good guys to work on that thing um you know hell we about the time we started that Hagen was just shutting down, and we got two or three of their Todd Barrier and several there Jesse Coke. Some of the, you know, some, okay. yeah. we had we had a couple level truck team for Skinner. And, you know, we won eight races the first two years, eight eight and ninety five and eight and ninety six, and won the championship the first year. But it was totally different for me, man. It was so many places I'd never been before. You didn't have to sit on the airplane for an hour and a half taxiing to get take off like the cup was getting. Um, it was just uh, more like it used to be when I kind of first started. And, and um, there again, it was a new challenge. You know, it was something I challenged myself with. And then that rolled over into the into the Bush cars in 2000. We started building Bush cars in 99 and switched totally over in 2000. But the transition into the into the desks side of it, it it was gradual because um the budget became a bigger and bigger part of racing you know we went through that stage of um there was so much money coming into the sport you didn't really even watch out for the money you were spending you just spent whatever it took to be successful and um but as 
as time went on and you had to start turning over every leaf to see where your money was being spent. So you spent more time doing that and, uh, you know, making people happy and things like that. You know, it's dealing with personnel. It was a, it became about a full-time job anyway, before I got the opportunity to, uh, at, there again, it was just, I got to a point again where I'm like, I am absolutely sick and tired of traveling. You mentioned this earlier, but Dale finally won the Daytona 500 in 1988. And obviously you were happy for Dale, and you said it was the biggest win of your career, even though you weren't there. But was there at least a small twinge of disappointment that you weren't there and going over No, the not one bit. Not really? One, no. I mean, really? I've never I, – I, I can honestly say I can't look back at anything about the sport and, and, and have any regret. Even now, you know, um, you know, when that there'd be times in the bush race where I'd like try not to go to a race and they'd go win, and you know, hell, it's like I, I, I would consider I was doing my job if they could could win without me. You know, you hire, you want to, you want people around you that don't have to have you, and uh, if you want success, but no, never, uh, not one regret because I knew what it was like, I knew what they were feeling. You know, two or three of them called me, probably the. You know, I'm, 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 David wasn't on it anymore. He was on the 31, but it was probably the same. It probably meant more. Chocolate was there, but I, it probably m meant more to Kirk and myself and David and people that weren't on that thing anymore than the people that actually won it, you know, because they hadn't been through what we'd been through. You know, that some of those guys had just been on that team for a year or two or three but and had never had the close calls that we had, so – like I said, several people probably called me before they called their family. Did you get a ring? I did. Did you really? Yeah, from him. Did you? Yes, sir. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. He knew the deal. I mean, you know, he yeah. knew that he knew the sacrifice and the um, he knew that, hell, it, it hurt us as bad as it hurt him when we'd lose that damn race. And, and so, yeah, that I got, a, I got a pretty good collection of rings, and that that's probably means more to me, the fact that he – that you got me one. All right, so February 18th, 2001. What do you remember about that day? Um, unfortunately, uh, I remember it super, super clear. You know, it like everybody else, you didn't think it was that bad at first. Um, no, you weren't there. No, uh, we had run the bush race and gone home. And, uh, uh, you know, you see it happening, you see it unfolded. And, you know, just it's kind of weird. You know, we, we've all seen it a hundred times with what the, Daryl's reaction and, and um, which is another kind of funny thing, how that all played out, that they were such arch enemies and had become good friends in time. And so anyway, as, as it played out and then you saw that he was hurt, you still didn't think the worst. And um, but then I uh, got, a, got a few calls and, of course, you know, phones weren't our weren't then what they are now and and um but you knew it was bad because i got a couple calls and said it was bad and then uh, david smith actually called me yeah it's funny it's so funny to think that that still hurts like that ain't it yeah. um Obviously, it ha you want to take a minute? Mm, you okay? Nah. All right. Obviously, it had a major impact on the What's team. What's really funny is I would do this very same thing if I was watching it on TV right now. You yeah. know, that it's still, not every time, but it still hurts. Excuse me. Obviously, it was not the same RCR mm. before and after. Mm. Um, the same deal, you know, like I said about Dale and Neil, it, it took something out of Richard that he'll never get back. So after that, when, when did you when did you leave RCR? The end of seventeen. End of seventeen. So and I was there. I was I was really close in my mind, and okay. and uh, I'd actually thought about it the year before, and um, you know there was a lot of a lot of new faces there, and there was you know there was a lot of people that had been there a long time that that um, you know there were 
I could see the writing on the wall. I knew my time was coming. And uh, like I said, I, I got no regrets on that. Been, probably been the best four years of my life has been the last four years. Because when you do what we did in racing, especially the early years, you don't know how to do anything else. And I, I, I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking for everybody that did it during those years because they, they all worked just as hard whether you were working for Petty or Jimmy Means or whoever it was, you know. Everybody sacrificed like that. And to do it successfully, and, and to, it's harder to be on a winning team than it is a losing team. It really is because uh, you just you, – expectations are just unbelievable, especially with a guy like Earnhardt. And – um but it takes something out of you to where you, man, you, you are, you're almost like a, somebody that got, got out of prison. you got to learn how to get back into being a normal person. Yeah. Um, you, I, I, when you sent me the text about doing this thing, I said, let me check my busy schedule. <laughs> you, you go yeah. damn near 40 years with you, everything about what you do is a clock or a calendar. You know, it's X amount of days to Daytona. It's, yeah. Like, like Chocolate said one time, he said, "I'm tired of hurrying. You got to hurry up and get on the plane. You got to hurry up and load the car. You got to hurry up." And, yeah. and and that's that's the way racing is. It was back then. It's way easier now, man. And guys got it. They got it made now. Make good money and don't have a clue. Some of them don't know how to change their own oil, and they're on. A, they're making making big money on a race team. Now, how are you spending most of your time these days? Um. So, uh, doing something that I know you would love. Um, I, I, I started restoring this old car, and I don't, you know, I don't have a shop at my house or anything. It's a Model T that was actually my grandfather's, and I've had it. Really? Yeah, I brought it up from from Florida like twenty something years ago, and it's just sat at my house. You know, it didn't like I had free weekends or anything. And when you do have free weekend you're damn cleaning your gutters and doing it. Yeah. We'd always come back from from a, a Christmas vacation or something, Richard. Would go, Everybody all rested up, and we're like, are you serious? <laughs> you know, all yeah. I did was try to catch up for not yeah. being home for yeah. the last three the months. But yeah. Exactly. But anyway, and so I started talking to Timmy Petty about doing some of the work over at his shop. And, um, now, are and, you living in Level Cross? Or no, I live in Lexington. I live on okay. High Rock. Okay, all right. But Timmy still works at RCR, okay. and his shop is in his dad's old shop, and he does motor stuff. And um, But he's also restoring uh, one of the King's 74 Chargers that somebody had bought a few years back, and, yeah. and uh, we just uh, finished rebuilding a, the a Hemi to put in it. And I know you being a big Petty fan, yeah. you would really enjoy what we've been through the last – and I've enjoyed that so much being around those – Three brothers that have such a history, um, so many stories about Maurice, and and been really uh, been been better for me than it has been for them. But I just go over there on the weekends and help them, and I've done. An, I've always wanted to archery hunt elk, and I've done that some uh, out in Montana with David Allen, the guy that used to do the Good Wrench mm -hmm. um, deal, and. Just having a normal life for the first time. I've got three grandkids and and uh, just being a I'm not a prisoner anymore. Life awesome. is good. 